Hello everyone and welcome to this tutorial. In this tutorial, we are going to continue our discussion on the material definition of ductile metals in abacus. We are going to focus on defining the material hardening rule for simulations involving uh, cyclic hardening or cyclic loading. If you remember, in the previous uh, tutorial, we discussed how to define the basic uh, elastoplastic parameters of a given metal and we used steel as an example. We showed how to convert an engineering stress strain curve to a true stress strain curve, which we then uh, used as an input in Abacus to define the elastic part of the material behavior, the elastic branch and the plastic branch of the material. In the previous tutorial, we stopped at this slide regarding the selection of the hardening rule type from these multiple options available from this drop down menu. We also said last time that the hardening rule type does not matter, meaning it will not affect the results, if uh, you are simulating a model that is involving monotonic loading, such as uh, uniaxial monotonic coupon tests. The hardening rule, however, matters when the material undergoes load reversals. So basically, if your simulation involves cyclic loading, then this, this selection isotropic, kinematic, or combined, or whatever the hardening rule is, will affect the response of your simulation. Take for example here, uh, this cyclic response of steel material, and notice here that we start the yielding point at the beginning of the loading around here, but this change in the subsequent uh, load reversal. So once I do a load reversal, now the yield point starts here, and then I start getting plastic deformations. And if you may observe from this graph, this value here of the yield stress is not symmetric or is not the same as the one that we started with. And the same thing, if you go again to another load reversal, you can see here that this point now, the transition from the elastic branch to the plastic branch is different and so on. And also in this example here, you will notice how the material strength grows each cycle. So you see the size of the hysteretic cycles are getting bigger. So this is what we call cyclic hardening. And this shift in point, this is the center of the yield surface, which is this range. This is the yield surface size. The center of this yield surface is moving from when we started with the origin. And then let's say in this cycle, it's right over here. In the last cycle over here, it's the center of the yield range is over here. So you can see these observations and these changes in the yield location and the yield size. So hardening rule under cyclic loading. So what exactly do we want to define? Well, there are two basic things that we define. The first thing is the yield criterion also known as the yield surface shape or the shape of the yield surface. Basically, this is the criterion that will let Abacus know that the yield point is reached. So this is a criteria that will tell Abacus that now the yield point is reached and now there will be a transition from the elastic branch to the plastic branch as we've seen in the previous slide. The second component of our definition would be what we call the plastic flow rule. And the plastic flow rule basically defines how this yield surface changes in shape with each plastic deformation and also how this yield surface moves, the center of this yield surface moves again with increasing plastic deformation. So the first one tell us if yielding occurs or not. The second one tell us how this yield criterion pretty much, which is the yield surface, it changes location and changes in size with accumulating plastic deformations. Now, a disclaimer before we start uh, this tutorial, I'm going to focus here on the basic and general differences between the different hardening rules, like the isotropic hardening versus the kinematic hardening. And I will focus on how to define uh, practically the parameters in Abacus for each model. So I'm not uh, going to go uh, in depth into the theoretical background and the gritty details of the mathematical model that describe these hardening rules because this could take a, a very long video. 
and also to keep things simple in this tutorial. Uh, however, I will leave you some additional references in the video description that you can refer to since it's highly recommended, of course, that you actually read the appropriate literature and understand the mathematical formulation of the hardening model, which uh, perhaps you may have already learned if you have taken any uh, course on mechanics of material uh, in grad school. So now starting with the first uh, definition of the hardening rule, which is the yield surface criterion. Uh, I will start here with a quick background with a illustration that perhaps you have seen several times. As you probably already know that any point in the 3D space of your finite element model, if you take any point in your finite element model, it's a 3D model, you will see that it's subjected to nine stress components, three normal stresses acting on each face and six shear stress components, two acting on each face. We typically tabulate these nine components of stress in a matrix form as shown here in what we call the stress tensor. Now, as you know here, yielding occurs when you reach the yield stress sigma y. But the question is, which of the nine stress components would you use to check for yielding? Like, would you check if sigma 1, 1, the normal stress 1, 1 is larger than sigma y or 2, 2 or 3, 3 or maybe one of the shear stresses? So which one should we use? Well, in literature, there are actually a number of yield criteria or yield theories in literature that you can use. Uh, these ones like such as Rankine year theory, the Tresca or the von Mises yield criteria, which you probably heard of. Each one is generally better for specific engineering failure uh, problems, but for metals, the von Mises is the one commonly used, which is also the case in the metal plasticity material model that we use in Abacus. But anyway, those methods, uh, essentially, they compute some equivalent stress metric to check for yielding. So they take all these stresses and then they find some kind of an equivalent stress and this equivalent stress is the one that we use to check for yielding. Now for the von Mises, what we call the von Mises equivalent stress or sigma v, this one is computed based on this equation. This is the general equation for the von Mises equivalent stress. And after you compute this stress, which you can visualize in Abacus, this is what we typically, once we look at the results in Abacus, this is what we, the contours that we find is the one for the von Mises equivalent stress. And the yielding now, the criteria here is or takes place if this equivalent von Mises stress reaches the yielding stress sigma y. Of course, there are simpler uh, variations of this general formula that you can find online for specific stress cases such as plane stress or uniaxial stress and so on, the general equation can get smaller and much simpler. If you look at uniaxial stress, all the stress components becomes equal to zero and the only thing sigma v or the von Mises stress is the single uniaxial stress sigma 1. You probably have seen this, so this is again in the 2D uh, case like planar, uh, plane stress uh, case. This is the formulation for the von Mises, the simplified formulation. And again, if you have the element, so now you have the principal stresses acting on this element, sigma 1 and sigma 2. And if you plot the yield surface, if you plot this equation in the plane of the principal stresses, you will get this elliptical shape, which is captured by this formula. And if you compute your point here, sigma v, and it's somewhere inside, this elliptical shape, this means you are in the elastic region. And if you reach it, this means that you have transitioned into the plastic domain or the plastic branch. Of course, in the 3D space, this elliptical shape becomes a cylindrical shape if we extrude it out of the slide. So that's it for the yield criterion. Now let's uh, move and talk about the plastic flow rule. And the first thing for the plastic flow rule or the hardening, let's talk about the isotropic hardening and how does it work. Again, here on the left, I have 
the stress strain relation and on the right here i have the principal stress space sigma 1 and sigma 2 with the yield criterion uh, for the von mises already plotted and then let's see what happens if you are using an isotropic uh, hardening uh, rule what happens is let's say that we assume that we start loading and then you are on the elastic branch and then once you reach this point which is sigma y the yield stress of your material then this means that in the principal stress plane your point is right on the elliptical surface so now what happens now abacus knows that this criteria is satisfied so now we are moving into the plastic branch so now you are going to start moving on the plastic branch so you will have perhaps like some hardening like this and then you will stop let's say at this orange point right here so what will happen if you stop at this point and you start doing a load reversal at this point because you have pushed beyond the initial yield surface what will happen is that right now this new point is over here and actually the surface the new surface of your yield will be this blue one so this is now the new one the one that got bigger all right so the green one doesn't exist anymore and now we are this is our new yield criterion surface so now if i move back if i unload my new yield will take place at the edge of the blue ellipse over here and this means right now again that we ended the elastic branch and we're moving into the plastic domain if you keep loading and you stop at one point so this means the our yield surface shifts and this will become our new yield point and then you will have a new elliptical surface and then if i unload again i need to go all the way to the top to this point the edge of the black or the new elliptical uh, yield surface and then you get your yield point and then so on and so on so basically what you notice here in isotropic hardening that the yield surface expands uniformly okay so it is getting bigger the center of it doesn't change all right so everything is the same it's only the size of the yield uh, surface is getting bigger and in other words the yield point sigma y keeps getting larger while the accumulated plastic strain are pushed further so now let's see how the kinematic hardening uh, works so the same thing if you start with loading the first thing you reach the first yield point of the first surface and then if you push it further into with some hardening into the plastic branch and if you stop over here what will happen is that your new yield surface will shift and actually the same size of this yield surface remains the same but the center is shifted upward as you see over here so now if i unload from this point my yield point will be the intersection of the unloading slope with this range over here so if i go i stop at this point and then if i keep increasing and i stop let's say at this point so this means if i stop here then my new yield surface is shifted again and so on if i go back this will be my new yield point and so on so what you notice here is that the yield surface size remains constant but its center shifts that's why we call it kinematic because it keeps moving the yield surface keeps moving in other words you can say that the stress range between the yield points so if i measure the distance between this yield point in let's say compression and this yield point in tension this range is equal to 2 sigma y so it remains constant so this is what we call kinematic hardening and this is also known as the boschinger effect so you have this asymmetric hysteresis if you keep pushing further you will see that you start yielding much much earlier not in a symmetric way as we have seen previously in the isotropic hardening 
Now we mentioned earlier that this hardening rule, like whether you choose as tropic or high kinematic, doesn't really matter if you are doing monotonic loading. But also if you are defining an elastic, perfectly plastic material, like the one I'm showing over here, if this is what you define in Abacus, similar to what we did last time, if you do an elastic, perfectly plastic behavior, you will also not see any difference whether you choose isotropic or kinematic, because again, you don't have a hardening slope. So sigma y is constant pretty much. So nothing changes whether you use isotropic or kinematic, it's pretty much the same. So you don't see any observation regarding the type of hardening. However, if you put a hardening slope, you will see now the difference, it becomes evident. So under isotropic, you see the symmetric behavior between the compression side and let's say the tension side. And you see again, the cycles or the size of the yield surface keep getting bigger with accumulated plastic deformations. The kinematic on the other hand, we see the asymmetric behavior between the compression and tension sides. And we see that the yield surface or the yield range is remains constant and doesn't change. So if we are doing modeling some kind of, uh, or doing some kind of simulation in Abacus that involves cyclic hardening, we want to add a combined hardening rule. So we need to see an isotropic and kinematic hardening rules taking place in my material behavior because this captures the actual behavior of the metal and particularly here I'm talking about uh, steel and its variations. So let's see how can we define a combined hardening rule in Abacus. Well, first thing from the drop down menu, you will need now to scroll all the way down and select combined. You will see a drop, another drop down menu will appear that says data type. And what you need to define here, you need to define the kinematic component of the combined hardening rule. So how can we define the kinematic component? Well, Abacus defines the kinematic hardening using this equation that relates the stress with the equivalent plastic strain. Notice here, this is the equivalent plastic strain. And this relates the two quantities with using this exponential formula. And you have these two constants, C and gamma. C is called the kinematic hardening modulus and gamma is the rate at which C, the kinematic hardening modulus decreases with increasing equivalent plastic strain. So the first option that you can define this is by input the data for a half cycle of a tensile uniaxial tensile test. So similar to the one that we did in the previous tutorial, you can go here and then you can insert the tabulated data for your yield stress and the plastic strain directly. So this is the plastic uh, branch of your true stress strain behavior. And then you can input the data directly over here. This is called the half cycle approach. What will happen in the background when you input this data, Abacus will automatically fit this model over here to the data and Abacus will obtain some values for C and gamma and Abacus will use these values to compute the material modeling hardening inside the mathematical operations. The second option is you can use the stabilized cycle data. And for this, you will need to conduct cyclic, a symmetric cyclic uniaxial test like this with a constant amplitude. And you keep doing this constant amplitude in the lab until you get a stabilized hysteretic behavior, pretty much as you see here from the start, the yield surface, as we mentioned before, start getting bigger and bigger, but at one point become stable or constant. And in that case, you can extract this branch of this stabilized cycle. You can extract it outside and then you can input the data for this stabilized cycle as stress and plastic strain tabulated data. And again, Abacus is going to fit this data with this model to obtain the parameters. The one that we typically use, so we typically use either the half cycle because most applications we have at least the uniaxial tensile test, but we can also use the parameters directly. So instead of Abacus computing the C and gamma, we can directly choose the parameters and then we can input directly 
the values for C and gamma. So in an Excel sheet or using a MATLAB code or something like that, you can play with the values of C and gamma in order to generate this relation between the stress and the plastic strain of the plastic branch. Now, a couple of things to note here. This is not very easy to do because the same curve can be obtained by several combinations between C and gamma. So if you do this uh, calibration, what you are getting is not really a unique solution. So just keep that in mind. But as long as you are getting the shape of the curve that you want, then you can input these parameters over here. You have another option over here, but it's, uh, it's not shown here because of the drop down menu. This is what says number of back stresses. And right now I'm using one. So this is another option that you can choose. You can actually, instead of defining this curve using a single set of C and gamma parameters, you can use a number of back stresses. So this is one instance that you can do. You can define three different sets of C and gamma. Each one defines a different hardening curve. And then Abacus is going to combine those three curves together in order to get the final hardening curve. So this actually can provide a better capturing of the shape of the plastic behavior with a better accuracy. But in, for most application, one back stress or two at most would be totally fine. The next thing for the combined hardening rule is to define the isotropic component which you can access here from the sub options and then you can select cyclic hardening. When you do that, you will get this window over here and this window is asking you to provide the equivalent stress and the equivalent plastic strain. These are different than the one that we used to get from, let's say, from this stabilized curve or from this half cycle. The equivalent one are different because this is the equivalent plastic strain, which is in Abacus, it's called the PEEQ. It has the symbol PEEQ for the field variable. And this is the equivalent stress. So how can you obtain this data? So again, if you have a symmetric cyclic coupon uniaxial test with a constant amplitude, what you can do is you can take this data you can get this data point. So pretty much you want to define here the change because we mentioned this is isotropic hardening. So you want to capture the change in the size of the yield surface with accumulated plastic deformations. So you can get here the value of the equivalent stress at each cycle. And then if you have this data, you can compute in MATLAB or in Excel, you can compute the equivalent plastic strain which is the accumulated, the integration pretty much of the logarithmic strain of your coupon test. FYI here that the equivalent plastic strain, it goes from zero all the way to one. So it's always increasing. It doesn't go negative. It's always positive. This is the equivalent plastic strain. You can check in the literature or the documentation for Abacus about how to compute this value. The other option, instead of doing that, so the other option is to select this checkbox over here and use parameters directly. So when we are using the parameters, what we need to define, we need to define the yield stress, the initial yield stress, which is the one that we get from a typical coupon test. And then we need to define these two parameters, Q infinity and B. Again, these two parameters, the Q infinity, this is the maximum change in the yield size, which basically the extent of the cyclic hardening range here. The Q infinity has the units of stress. So if you are using Newton per millimeter square, MPA, so Q infinity will be in MPA. And B is the rate at which QB changes with increasing equivalent plastic strains. Because if you see here in this example that I'm showing over here, Let's say that you are specifying Q infinity to be 100 megapascal. So if you start from 300 megapascal at the initial point, cyclically with increasing cycles until the point of saturation, you are going to reach 400 megapascal. But how is this reached? What is the rate? So if you look at this example 
plot over here, you see that in the first cycle, you increased maybe 60 megapascal. And then if you look at the subsequent cycle, you increased by 10, only 10. And then the one after you increased by just five. So this rate, this rate, how you saturate to the maximum value, this is the parameter B, which is the rate. So again, Abacus is going to use these values Q and B in this equation to find the size of the yield surface at any increment during the analysis. Now we mentioned that the Q and B parameter, the Q infinity and B parameters, as well as the C and gamma that we discussed previously are not unique. So you can get different combinations of the two to get the same behavior. So the appropriate way to do that, to do a calibration of your material model with different coupon tests that involves different loading history. So you have your typical uniaxial monotonic test. You have the symmetric cyclic with constant amplitude. You have one with asymmetric strain, cyclic strains, and with ramped cyclic strains. So you need to do like a number of histories and then fit or calibrate your model against those in order to obtain the best parameters that fit the data. So in this uh, reference that I'm showing over here, I put as well additional references in the video description. You can actually find for steel, you can find this calibration that has been conducted, thorough calibrations for uh, different types of steel materials that are used in structures like S355 that's used in Europe, a992 that's used in the US as well as some other grades that are used in China and so on. So you can use this directly to obtain the values for Q infinity, B, C1 and gamma and additionally if you want to put two back stresses you can add additional parameters. To obtaining those parameters there is one way to do it from actually doing coupon test and doing calibration in order to find these parameters or you can use some available uh, calibration that has already been conducted in uh, literature. Uh, this is the final side that shows you like some examples here. So this is some hysteretic behavior where I'm using a value of C of 10,000 megapascal and gamma 100 and I'm not using any cyclic hardening. So that's why you don't see any change in the size of the yield surface. So I put Q infinity and B equal to zero. So this is how it looks like. By the way, if you want, you see here the plastic hardening part, this kinematic hardening part, you see how it goes. It's like curved like this. If you reduce the value of gamma, you will start getting a more linear hardening behavior. The one on the right, we see the same model, but in this one, we put cyclic hardening. So you put Q infinity with 100 megapascal and B equal to 10. And you see here the same model, you reached higher stresses with increasing plastic deformations because the size of the yield surface increased by how much actually the maximum would be 100. So if we started by 300, you would see that the maximum that you would reach would be around 400. So that's it for this tutorial. I hope you find it uh, useful. Again, the parameters one way or the other, you can use it directly if you're doing steel from this uh, table, which I will put the link for the publication in the references, or you can do it uh, the other way by doing the actual coupon tests, cyclic and monotonic, and then doing the calibration yourself. Thank you and we'll see you in the next tutorial.